Charles did me a favor by inviting me to, uh, um, to address this group. The usual course of a day for a college president can be, let us say, challenging, but sometimes tedious. You deal with this, the small details of university administration, college administration. We're a new college, so everything we do is precedent setting, which means that everything we do requires detailed discussions of principle. Uh, when intellectuals do that, as you can imagine, it can be tiresome. Um, uh, so what Charles asked me to do is basically pull myself out of my day-to-day -day concerns and think about a few other issues that, um, that are concern, of concern to me, although initially I wasn't sure what I would discuss because I'm not a researcher of anti-Semitism. Um, I've published the odd piece on Islamic varieties of anti-Semitism, but even that I haven't done for a very long time. Um, but during the summer war between Hamas and Israel, I wrote a short piece with the same title as this presentation. If you go online, you'll find it. Uh, it's called Gaza Equals Auschwitz. And there I documented a surge in this sort of analogy from a specific source. That was the faculty of Columbia University. Um, experts call this Holocaust inversion. Holocaust inversion is the claim that Israel acts towards the Palestinians as the Nazis acted toward the Jews. Uh, in that article, I called it Jew baiting. Um, and I wrote this, and I quote myself here. Jew baiting covers a wider range than anti-Semitism, and Holocaust inversion is its favorite technique. Um, in other words, I chose not to label it anti-Semitism, but to put it in another category. I called it Jew baiting, and I'll come to that in a moment. Um, the practice of which might not necessarily be anti-Semitic. Now, after I published that piece, uh, I began to wonder whether I'd been sufficiently rigorous in uh, my classification of Holocaust inversion. And I'm still interested in the question of whether it does deserve to be read as anti-Semitism, and I will get back to that at the end of this talk. But on the way, I've asked another more compelling question, and it is this. Just what purpose does Holocaust inversion serve? And here I'm not talking about crackpot websites or often Karachi, um, but among people whom we assume to be sophisticated about history and politics. Uh, for once, we are in the realm of academics and leading institutions. I think it is highly unlikely that anyone actually believes that Israel conducts itself as Nazi Germany did. And that goes for intellectuals who make or allude to the analogy, as well as to their elite audiences. And yet, and yet, it continues to surface in a variety of forms, it's even gaining, one could argue, wider dissemination. So what is, what is going on here? What actual function do these claims really fill? And what I want to do is share some of my tentative conclusions. And I say they are tentative. This is my first crack at this. And so any input that you can give me, which will um, assist me in seeing it perhaps from an angle that I missed, will be useful. And so I welcome. Uh, your responses and questions and comments later. But before I get into this question of the function, thank you. Um, let me give you a brief, I want to say potted history of Holocaust inversion um, and its different forms. It's evolved in three stages. The first stage was invented by British sympathizers of the Arabs, even as the ashes still filled the crematoria. It was then picked up by the Soviet Union with particular fever after, fervor after 1967. And its latest and present iterations are on the left in the West, uh, including the academy and in the Muslim world and wherever they overlap. So let me illustrate with a few examples from each of these three phases. Um, we are indebted to the historian Rory Miller uh, who's shown us that the analogy between Zionism and Nazism even predates, predates the creation of the state of Israel. Amazingly, it was a staple of anti-Zionist rhetoric in Britain as early as the mid-1940s, that is, just by the, in the late stages of the war, um, when Europe teamed with Jewish refugees and before even one Palestinian Arab had taken flight. 
Um, the disseminators of this notion were some British Arabists and the so-called Arab office. The Arab office was a um, pro-Arab information or propaganda office um, which had been set up to make the Palestinian Arab case in London, which was, of course, then the center of decision making on the British mandate uh, over Palestine. Their champion was a man named Sir Edward Spears. And this is what he wrote in 1945. Remember, this is three years before the creation of the State of Israel, at the conclusion of the war. The quote, political Zionism as it is manifested in Palestine today preaches very much the same doctrines as Hitler. Zionist policy in Palestine has many features similar to Nazi philosophy. The politics of Herrenvolk, the Nazi idea of Lebensraum, is also very in evidence in the Zionist philosophy. The training of youth is very similar under both organizations that have designed this one and the Nazi one, end of quote. And there are many more instances which Professor Miller brings. Now, if this claim is worth mentioning at all, it's to demonstrate that the attempt to assimilate Zionism to Nazism began even, even as Europe teemed with Jewish refugees um, and victims, even as the collaborationist Mufti of Jerusalem was on the run from Berlin, even before the word Holocaust became current, that happened only later, and even before an Israeli army fired its first shot. The approach of anti-Zionists uh, was to always associate Zionism with the most threatening and ominous evil of the day. Now, there's a paradox here. Um, at the very moment that the British Arabists were warning that a Jewish state would behave in a Nazi manner, the American Arabists, the people in the State Department, were warning that it would behave in a communist one because they thought, well, this Zionist movement is socialist and had affiliations with the Soviet Union and might turn into a Soviet bridgehead in the Middle East. So the most threatening and ominous evil looked very different from Washington. Um, uh, but one way or another, there's no evidence that either projection, Israel would behave in a Nazi way or a communist way, had any impact on policy uh, in London or Washington. Now, the most famous case of a British supporter of the Arab cause propounding the equivalence of Nazism and Zionism was the big think historian Arnold Toynbee, um, who was a cult figure in the English-speaking world. Some of you are probably too young to have read him, but you go back and you'll find his picture on the cover of Time magazine way back in the 50s, uh, when wise men from Europe were considered to be um, um, oracles. Um, and Toynbee took his place with the publication of his famous study of history in many volumes. Um, he was also known for his far-fetched analogies. Um, Toynbee once called the contemporary Israeli, and I quote him, a Janus figure, part American farmer technician, part Nazi uh, Sicarius. A Sicarius is an assassin. Um, he also accused Israel of, quote, inflicting on an innocent, weaker neighbor the Arabs, Palestinian Arabs, the very sufferings, the very sufferings that the original victim, the Jews, had experienced at his stronger neighbor's hands, at the hands of the Nazis. Uh, Toynbee outdid even himself when he wrote this sentence in volume eight of his uh, study of history. And I quote him, and listen carefully. On the day of judgment, the gravest crime standing to the German National Socialists, the Nazis, to their account, might be not that they had exterminated a majority of the Western Jews, but that they had caused the surviving remnant of Jewry to stumble. Right, the stumble, of course, being Zionism and the creation of Israel, which is here cast as a more criminal venture even than the Nazi extermination itself. And needless to say, Toynbee did not go unanswered, um, and um, uh, this caused quite a bit of back and forth at the time. But the really big boost to the equation of Zionism with Nazism came uh, in the Soviet Union and began in the 1950s. It was Soviet propaganda that first began to equate the Star of David with the swastika uh, in cartoons. It was in the Soviet Union that books were published alleging Zionist-Nazi collaboration. And after 1967, it was the Soviets who turned up the volume to high on the Zionist equals Nazi amplifier. Now here are just a couple of the most noteworthy examples. The Soviet premier Alexei Kosygin at the United Nations in June 1967, 
that is, right on the heels of the Six-Day War. The Israeli occupation was days old. Um, quote, what is going on in areas occupied by the Israeli troops brings to mind the, the heinous crimes perpetrated by the fascists during World War II. In the same way as Hitler's Germany used to appoint Gauleiters to the occupied regions, the Israeli government is establishing an occupation administration on the seized territories and appointing its military governors there. And here is Party Secretary General Leonid Brezhnev uh, the following month in Moscow. Quote, in the atrocities against the peaceful Arab populations, it seems the Israelis try to copy the crimes of the Nazi invaders. The aggressors conduct themselves like the worst bandits and commit atrocities in the Hitlerite style." End of quote. Um, now, it would be the Soviet example, I think, that the Arab propagandists would emulate, um, at first very hesitantly, because uh, Nazism didn't have the same range of negative associations in the Arab world as Zionism had. Uh, but the more Arabs became aware of the Holocaust and the extent of Nazi crimes, the more eager they became to equate Zionism with Nazism. Um, and this would spread still further into the Muslim world at large. And there are a number of, there are two examples of Nasser himself saying that the Zionist crimes exceeded those of the Nazis. Um, Mahmoud Darwish, the Palestinian national poet, on one occasion said the same thing. And Yasser Arafat told his biographer, Alan Hart, that while he said, I'm not one who usually resorts to the Nazi analogy, I must say that, I, uh, that Israel is committing crimes which exceed those of, of the Nazis. So that's another topic, and there's actually a very good book by Webman and Litvak, which has a whole chapter devoted to the way in which this analogy is used in the Islamic world. Um, and I'll just give maybe one example, which I find amusing because it, it, in it uh, stars Shimon Peres, no less. Um, Nobel Prize winning um, uh, um, peace dip, um, uh, 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 peace, well, what can one say? Peace advocate um, and the architect of um, the Oslo Accords. Um, and the eve of the, the Durban conference, he appeared on the cover of an Egyptian weekly in a Nazi uniform. Uh, he was foreign minister at the time. And when this drew criticism in Israel and elsewhere, a bevy of Egyptian intellectuals began to write to defend this analogy. Um, and here's a quote uh, from one of them. Perez committed and commits more ugly acts against the Arabs than the Nazis did against the Jews. That about Shimon Perez. Um, and another wrote that Hitler, quote, Hitler is the one who is unjustly treated in the comparison with Perez. Um, so that gives you the sense that really no one is immune to this kind of uh, analogizing in the Arab Islamic world. Um, the, today, of course, the preeminent disseminator of Holocaust inversion in the Muslim world is the president of Turkey and the former premier of Turkey, uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who returns to this theme repeatedly. Uh, here is a prime example from this past summer, and I quote him, what is the difference between Israeli actions and those of the Nazis and Hitler? How can you explain what the Israeli state has been doing in Gaza, Palestine, if not genocide? This is racism, this is fascism, this is keeping Hitler's spirit alive." End of quote. And there are many other quotes from uh, Mr. Erdogan to that effect. Now in the Western Academy, uh, all of these threads have come together. The Arabist tradition, <coughs> leftist agitprop, originally of Soviet inspiration, and Arab Muslim nationalism, creating hothouse conditions for the spread of Holocaust inversions into the writings and the classroom pronouncements of professors. Uh, and let me end this short example, there's a short history with a couple of the examples that I had assembled for this article over the summer uh, from members of the Columbia University faculty. The first is from Joseph Massad, professor of Arab studies. Uh, Massad had earlier been accused by some students of Holocaust inversion in class. And in his defense, he had written the following, and I quote him, the lie claiming that I would equate Israel with Nazi Germany is abhorrent. I have never made such a reprehensible equation, end of quote. So Mossad was fully aware of the abhorrent and reprehensible nature of Holocaust inversion. But a few years later, after another Gaza flare-up, uh, he published an article. This article was entitled, The Gaza Ghetto Uprising. Um, and not only was it entitled the Gaza Ghetto Uprising, but it was illustrated with that famous image of the surrendering child 
in the Warsaw Ghetto with his hands in the air. Um, the article invoked an alleged Israeli plan to, quote, make Israel a purely Jewish state that is Palestine Rhein. And Mossad characterized the Palestinian Authority, or rather what he called the Israeli-created Palestinian Collaborationist Authority, as the Judenrat, the Nazi equivalent. Now, this past summer, another uh, Columbia professor, uh, Hamid Dabashi, who's known for his somewhat inflammatory rhetoric, um, wrote this under the influence of the Hamas-Israel war, and I quote him, after Gaza, not a single living Israeli can utter the word Auschwitz without it sounding like Gaza. Auschwitz, as a historical fact, is now archival. Auschwitz, as a metaphor, is now Palestinian. From now on, every time any Israeli, every time any Jew, anywhere in the world utters the word Auschwitz or the word Holocaust, the world will hear Gaza." End of quote. It's from that that I take the title of my, my talk. I wonder what some of the survivors of Auschwitz would think about learning that, um, as a historical fact, their experience is now archival. Um, now, notice how this kind of academic Holocaust inversion has evolved. It's a bit more elusive. It's a bit more elusive. Um, and it's also <coughs> theoretical. Go back to the original article, and you'll see many references to Adorno. Uh, we are in the world of metaphors. Um, not only that, but in the academic academic Holocaust inversion, it's sometimes not the Holocaust or Nazi Germany that are evoked by name. There's a species of this that uh, accuses Israel of genocide, or some variant of it, such as slow motion genocide. You say, why slow motion genocide? Genocide usually depletes a population, an assumption which is contradicted by the Palestinian case. Um, now, this would take us off in another direction. I've been in that direction before. I don't intend to go there now. Uh, but while genocide is obviously a comparative concept, which is not limited to the Holocaust, sometimes the context of the claim about genocide does refer directly to it and is a kind of Holocaust inversion. So in sum, uh, the point of Holocaust inversion remains steady. Israel acts towards the Palestinians as the Nazis acted towards the Jews, albeit or perhaps on a different scale. Uh, and here it may be useful, just as a, an aside, uh, to point to an offshoot on the Israeli left um, of this, which was inspired originally by the philosopher Yeshayahu Leibovitch. Maybe some of you know that uh, Leibovitch uh, once called the Israeli judges who authorized what's called moderate physical force uh, on Palestinian de detainees. He called them Judeo-Nazis. Um, and it caused quite a stir at the time. Yitzhak Rabin, who was prime minister, um, was informed that Leibovitch was going to be awarded the Israel Prize. He said, I would not attend the ceremony. And so Leibovitch says, I will not accept the prize. Um, over this phrase, you can call it the N-word, Israeli style, Nazi e evocations. Um, you might have also noticed it uh, in a refined version just this past year when the author Amos Oz called the legal settlers, what they call the hilltop youths, uh, Hebrew neo-Nazis. Um, I say refined because neo-Nazis are not Nazis. Um, and there's a distinction to be drawn there. It's also something that um, Nazis call themselves Nazis. People call neo-Nazis that. They don't necessarily call themselves that. Um, now we can add the former Shin Bet head, the late Avraham Shalom. If you saw the film The Gatekeepers, any of you see it? Um, he made a statement there, and I quote him, it's a brutal, brutal occupation force similar to the Germans in World War II, similar but not identical, end of quote. Yeah, Avram Shalom, who himself had been born in Vienna, I think, um, was, a, was a left activist in his later years and a major sponsor of the so-called Geneva Initiative. Um, some of this sounds like an echo of Toynbee, um, but Leibovitz or Oz or Shalom uh, still come from within the Zionist frame of reference, and they warrant uh, a different analysis. And by the way, any time that someone uses this in the Israeli framework, it usually ends badly for them. Uh, there's a strong reaction against it. It's done in a provocative way in order to capture a headline. Uh, but um, it, uh, uh, but the, the, the pushback, in the case of Amos Oz, it was quite dramatic, actually, um, usually um, um, uh, suggests that, uh, that it's a mistake to do it. Um, and what happens, of course, though, is that when this 
when such statements are made, um, um, they are seized upon outside Israel as validating Holocaust inversion. Um, Michael Oren, um, who had been Israeli ambassador to Washington, uh, described the effect of what uh, Shalom had said. Uh, I'll quote Michael, he said, uh, he said, I appear on a campus and a student gets up and says to me, you're speaking of your desire for peace, but your former FBI head is comparing you to a Nazi state. What are your comments on that? And I mean, it's uh, uh, obviously not the, uh, the kind of question that, um, that a, um, an ambassador would expect to deal with, especially coming from someone who had been uh, entrusted with the security of the state of Israel. Now, there's no doubt that Holocaust inversion today fulfills some of the same functions that it always did. It is a strategy to delegitimize Israel, while perhaps, depending on the context, simultaneously diminishing the Holocaust. Uh, the historian Deborah Lipstadt has said that Holocaust inversion, about Holocaust inversion, that it, and I quote her, elevates by a factor of a zillion any wrongdoings Israel might have done, and lessens by a factor of a zillion what the Germans did. Um, the, um, but it must be admitted, too, that the fact that Israel invokes the Holocaust to justify its existence, sometimes to justify its actions and policies, creates also a powerful incentive among its enemies to either, and critics, either to diminish the Holocaust, sometimes to deny the Holocaust, or when that seems either impossible or immoral, uh, to claim that Israel is replicating on some scale the Holocaust in its treatment of the Palestinians. The question I ask myself is this, does it actually work? Um, on the face of it, Holocaust inversion is a trap. Um, it is, even as Professor Joseph Mossad once stated, so abhorrent and so reprehensible that its effect would seem to be to discredit whoever deploys it. Um, and there are supporters of the Palestinian cause, especially Jewish supporters of the Palestinian cause, who from time to time urge that it not be used because it's so patently preposterous. I'll give you an example. Norman Finkelstein, right, uh, whose project is to, be, to, to, is to delink the Holocaust from Israel. He wrote a book called The Holocaust Industry. Um, um, has been known to discourage Holocaust inversion. Uh, he said that once an Arab told him that even if the Holocaust did happen, a concession, right, even if the Holocaust did happen, what about the Palestinian Holocaust? Finkelstein, and I quote him, he said, Finkelstein said, I said, you know, why do you have to drag in the Palestinian Holocaust? What's happening to the Palestinians is awful enough that you don't have to compare it to the Nazi Holocaust. And then, of course, Finkelstein knows that this is, um, um, this is a problematic comparison, to say the least. Uh, in 2009, Mark Levine, a historian and severe critic of Israel, published a piece in Al Jazeera on their website entitled, Gaza is no Warsaw Ghetto. Gaza is no Warsaw Ghetto. Then he enumerated all of Israel's crimes, but he also described the scale of what happened in Warsaw, and he made this warning, and I quote him, the use of highly charged historical comparisons that do not hold up to scrutiny unnecessarily weakens the Palestinian case against the occupation. In a propaganda war in which Palestinians have always struggled to compete, handing Israel supporters the gift, the gift, of inaccurate or exaggerated comparisons does not help this struggle, particularly not in Israel and the US, the two most important battlegrounds in this conflict. So here's Mark Levine, a Jewish supporter of the Palestinian cause, warning the Palestinians not to go down this route and that it is a gift, a gift to the supporters of Israel to make what he calls um, a comparison that does not hold up to scrutiny. So if Holocaust inversion is such a gift to Israel's supporters, why do people continue to give it? And in particular, people who should know better, like professors at Columbia, people who are surrounded by Israel's supporters, they live in one of the world's most Jewishly saturated environments. And it's one thing when Holocaust inversion is deployed in Pakistan or in Palestine, uh, because there it makes perfect sense as a tactic. But on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, really, um, I'm going to propose two explanations for what might otherwise seem inexplicable. <clears throat> the first is that Jews are particularly susceptible to Holocaust inversion. Now, you may think that that's paradoxical. After all, how could Jews, especially in America, where Holocaust awareness 
is very high, be susceptible to equating Nazi extermination of the Jews with Israel's treatment of the Palestinians. The vulnerability emerges from that interpretation of the Holocaust according to which this unique event burdens the Jews with a unique responsibility. Um, and ironically, I think probably the best summation of this was made by two Palestinians in an article they wrote who identified this point of vulnerability. When they wrote the following, and I quote them, the Holocaust does not free the Jewish state or the Jews of accountability. On the contrary, the Nazi crime compounds their moral responsibility and exposes them to greater answerability. They are the ones who have escaped the ugliest crime in history and now they're perpetrating reprehensible deeds against another people. So this, this is a fascinating idea that the Holocaust compounds the Jews' moral responsibility. Not only were they victims of the Holocaust, but now they bear a special responsibility, a special burden on account of it. Um, that idea was not invented by anti-Semites. It was invented by Jews who concluded that the Holocaust, itself a unique event, obligates Jews uniquely, uniquely to stand in the first line against injustice that in any way resembles the Holocaust in any of its many phases. And it's this concept, uh, and one might go so far as to call it a conceit because it presumes the Jews are gifted with some higher moral sensibility. It's this concept that makes some Jews especially vulnerable to the claims of Holocaust inverters, and it's why Holocaust inversion is often directed precisely at them. Um, and it's why I instinctively classified it as Jew baiting. Um, it's a tactic which is not directed against the, uh, towards the widest possible audience, but specifically towards Jews in order to provoke a response from Jews. Uh, because to everyone else it sounds totally preposterous. Let me give two examples of the vulnerability of two fervently Zionist Jews to Holocaust inversion. The first is the case of Jacobo Timurin who was an Argentine Jewish dissident in the dark days of the so-called Dirty War. He went off to prison. Israeli diplomacy finally got him freed, and he came to Israel as an immigrant. Um, and in 1982, he reported on the Israel, Israeli invasion of Lebanon. He wrote a book which was highly critical of it. I forget the title. I think it was called The Long War or something. Anyone remember? Um, now, needless to say, you know, the Holocaust inverters had a field day with Ariel Sharon's march toward Beirut. Uh, and Timmerman seemed at first to see through them. Here's a passage that Timmerman wrote, Harvard is mentioned in it, um, um, which appeared in that book. The Harvard, Princeton, and Columbia professors who went along with the PLO for years, were they allies or accomplices? To speak of a Palestinian genocide or of a Palestinian holocaust, to compare Beirut with Stalingrad or with the Warsaw Ghetto will move no one and will only serve to feed their egos and settle accounts with other academics in whom these images can arouse guilt feelings. Jews know what genocide is, a holocaust, a Nazi, end of quote. Um, so that was a very straightforward repudiation of the holocaust inverters in American academe. It's interesting that this is 1982. The same themes are returning over 30 years later. Um, He's saying, Jews know what genocide is when they see it. They know what Nazism is when they see it. And they won't be fooled and they won't be cajoled. Um, and yet elsewhere, in the same book, Timmerman showed his own vulnerability precisely to the tactic used by Holocaust inverters when they pinpoint some supposed similarity between Israeli and Nazi conduct in order to neutralize the Holocaust as a point of Israeli reference. And here is the quote. This is about... Lebanon, 1982. From now on, our tragedy will be inseparable from that of the Palestinians. Sounds like what Hamid Dabashir said earlier, right? Whenever someone says Auschwitz, people will hear Gaza. Inseparable. Our tragedy is inseparable from that of the Palestinians. Perhaps some of us will try to sidestep is the Israeli moral collapse by resorting to statistics and comparing Auschwitz to Beirut. In other words, so many more died in Auschwitz than in Beirut, etc. It will be in vain, he says. The victims of Auschwitz would never have bombed Beirut. Our moral collapse cannot be diluted by statistics, end of quote. Now, this dismissive reference to statistics, right, deeply discounts one of the core characteristics of the Holocaust, which is its scale and scope. Remember that a key element, by the way, in Holocaust denial is 
is to say that not so many Jews were killed, that the Jews exaggerated the numbers. Right? And once this is done, the door is wide open precisely to the kind of Holocaust inversion that Timmerman himself so abhors. For then any Palestinian suffering, regardless of its degree or the scale, becomes a similarity that places Israel in the dock with Nazism. I'll give you another more recent example which I think perfectly demonstrates both the knowledge that Holocaust inversion is perverse, yet manages to leave open the door to it. It appears in Ari Shavit's new book, My Promised Land, which I'm sure many of you have read, uh, more particularly in a, in a chapter that is really a recycled article from 1991, in which Shavit tells of his duty as a guard at a detention center in Gaza. This is before Israel evacuated Gaza. And there he manages to conjure up an analogy between this detention camp, um, which was probably no worse than Guantanamo and undoubtedly better than Abu Ghraib, between this camp and a Nazi extermination camp. Um, let me read you the quote from Mr. Shavit. Although unjust and unfounded, the haunting analogy is pervasive. And I, who have always abhorred the analogy, who have always argued bitterly with anyone who so much as hinted at it, can no longer stop myself. The associations are too strong. Like a believer whose faith is wavering, I go over the long list of counterarguments. All the well-known differences, most obvious. There are no crematoria here. Also, uh, and, in the, uh, uh, and in the Europe of the 1930s, there was no existential conflict between two peoples. Germany, with its racist doctrine, was organized evil. The Germans were in no real danger whatsoever. But then I realized that the problem is not in the similarity. No one can seriously think there is any real similarity. The problem is that there isn't enough lack of similarity. The lack of similarity is not strong enough to silence once and for all the evil echoes. It's a very curious passage. Um, um, there is no real similarity, and yet there isn't enough lack of similarity. I leave you to unravel the threads in that. Um, there isn't enough lack of similarity. This is exactly the opening that Holocaust inverters seek to enter. And that brings me to my key point. Um, the Holocaust inverter in Western academe doesn't believe that there is an actual equivalence between Israel and the Nazis. The Holocaust inverter knows perfectly well the history and the scale of the Holocaust. Knows it as well as Ari Shavit knows it. The Holocaust inverter even knows that the analogy, in some sense, is abhorrent and reprehensible. But he or she also knows that by making the analogy, the defendant, that is the supporter of Israel, will be compelled to enumerate all of the dissimilarities and in so doing leave exposed some superficial similarities that will prompt the Timmerman response or the Shavit response. That is, Auschwitz and Beirut, Auschwitz and Gaza are obviously not actual equivalents, but they belong to the same moral category. This is precisely the objective of Holocaust inversion, and Jews are the perfect target for it, because who, if not Jews, have the duty to sound the alarm when any form of injustice or cruelty has the potential to culminate in a Holocaust. In the same way, Palestinian propagandists who speak of a Palestinian Holocaust, Palestinian Holocaust, they don't claim that the Nakba, right, 1948, approximates the Holocaust in any historical sense, but their project is to find or allege small-scale similarities, right? a massacre in Lida, a forced labor camp at Ijlin, a hidden mass grave in Jaffa, all with the purpose of establishing the Palestinians as victims on an equal plane. Um, the second reason Holocaust inversion persists, despite its supposedly self-defeating excess, is that it makes lesser but still preposterous analogies sound more reasonable. Uh, so Israel is not Nazi, but it is fascist. So it isn't guilty of genocide but it commits massacres and mass killings. Gaza isn't a concentration camp or the Warsaw Ghetto, but it's the world's largest outdoor prison camp. And Israel isn't Nazi Germany, but it is apartheid 
South Africa. Having exhausted your outrage against the Nazi analogy, uh, you'll be a tad less vociferous in expressing your outrage at these other analogies, which are also specious, but which now appear reasonable and worthy of debate. Uh, in other words, Holocaust inversion is a kind of rhetorical softening up. I give an example in that article about um, Columbia professors. I gave you a couple of examples. And then along comes the moderate uh, Palestinian professor who says, well, actually, it was really like the fire bombings of the Germans and the Japanese in World War II. In other words, it's not the Nazis, it's just the fire bombings, which is also a totally specious claim, the indiscriminate fire bombing of, of, um, of Hamburg or Dresden. Um, suddenly seems reasonable and worthy of consideration. Um, so I say that Holocaust inversion in these cases is rhetorical softening up. Those who use it don't seek to make the Israeli Nazi analogy credible, which is an impossible task, but to make other analogies seem debatable. In other words, it's a straw man. And that's why the urgings of people like Mark Levine, who tells Palestinians that it's a mistake to do this, are pointless. Of course, Gaza is in Auschwitz. Levine isn't telling Holocaust inverters something they don't know. But if his argument is that it's a flawed strategy, the Holocaust inverters think otherwise, and that it works on those two planes that I indicated, and that it's worth the risks. And the counter to Levine is provided by a fellow named Jerome Slater. He's a Jewish academic critic of Israel at State University of New York, Buffalo. He wrote an interesting article just a couple of months ago. And in it, he said, he acknowledges that the Nazi analogy is, as he puts it, much too strong. But it has a merit, and I quote him, it results in a productive shock of recognition in Israel and among its friends. And he then adds, and I quote him, even the most severe criticism of Israel, that is the most far-fetched also, can hardly be counterproductive in light of the fact that nothing else has proven to be productive. That's not to deny that even limited or hypothetical analogies to Nazi Germany are risky. Nonetheless, because Israel has gone so far down the road to fascism, not Nazism, the risks must be run. Desperate times require desperate measures. So even though Slater knows that and admits that the analogy is specious, he still thinks deploying it can be productive in shocking Jews, Israel and its friends, he says, and that it's a risk worth taking, a risk worth taking. I think nothing more thoroughly demonstrates the instrumental use of Holocaust inversion. Those who make it don't believe it, but they use it to bait Jews into reaction. And that reaction will usually be one of outrage, but in some small percentage of instances, it will provoke someone to hear what Ari Shavit called evil echoes. Uh, after all, desperate times admit desperate measures. This has been, of course, the rationale of dissimulation and deception since time immemorial. Well, I now come to my final question. Is it anti-Semitic? Um, there was once something called the working definition of anti-Semitism of the European Monitoring Center on Racism and Xenophobia. It was considered to be a point of reference for all those interested in definitions. I think it's no longer current, is that correct? Right. Well, basically, they no longer make a definition. Um, and it included this statement. Examples of the ways in which anti-Semitism manifests itself with regard to the state of Israel, taking into account the overall context, could include, and in that list, drawing comparisons of contemporary Israeli policy to that of the Nazis. Now, the key caveat here is in the, the overall context, right? which I presume to mean that there must be some other less equivocal evidence of anti-Semitism in the rhetorical package in which the comparison appears. Um, that, I would argue, is certainly the case when Holocaust inversion surfaces in the Arab and Muslim world, uh, often in a setting which is saturated with anti-Semitic tropes about world Jewry's control of um, the media and um, um, the Israel lobby's grip on Washington and so forth, there it is clearly an anti-Semitic context. But Holocaust inversion is often deployed, sometimes even by Jews and Israelis, as a tactic uh, 
It's a despicable tactic because it plays on the vulnerabilities of Jews, on their unresolved ambivalence about having power in the world, on their propensity for moral self-flagellation. That doesn't make it that doesn't make Holocaust inversion anti-Semitic ipso facto. It just makes it exploitative. Um, and by the way, I should add that if you isolate this analogy and say this one um, in a certain context uh, is anti-Semitic and you forget to say that other analogies such as South African analogy, the apartheid analogy is also in certain overall contexts anti-Semitic. Then, um, then it's a serious omission. And that definition did omit, omit the other, uh, other problematic analogies. But if it is a form of exploitation, then how should it be combated? Uh, I've been descriptive so far, not prescriptive. Um, if it is true that people of basic intelligence and honesty just don't believe it, and it's usually put forward by people who don't believe it, um, refuting it by demonstrating that Israel isn't Nazi Germany would be unnecessary and self-abasing. And you notice I haven't wasted any time in this lecture refuting the claim itself. Um, in these instances, the analogy is probably best ignored because the whole purpose is precisely to provoke a discussion around a point of departure, which is an absurd premise. Um, so that would be one strategy. I do think that another prescription might be to remove Nazi analogies altogether from currency in regard to Israel. Um, Eli Wiesel has, for example, called comparisons of Nazi Germany with Iran unacceptable. Um, and I quote him, Iran is a danger, but to claim that it is creating a second Auschwitz, I compare nothing to the Holocaust. Nothing to the Holocaust. If the Holocaust is indeed a unique event in human history, and if Nazi Germany is unparalleled as a nexus of absolute evil, then promiscuously invoking uh, both of them to make some political point in the present uh, should be rejected, I think, across the board. Uh, what are the prospects for such a rhetorical truce? Well, I leave, I leave that to you to calculate yourself. Thank you.